start with in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 15. Praise the Lord. It says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden, but you must eat from the tree of you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat it, you will surely die. The Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper for him. Amen. And then we rest go down to um, verse twenty three, and the man said, This is the bone of my bone and the flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she came out of man. Verse 24, it says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and there was no fault or shame found in them. Father, we just thank you for your reading of your word today. Father, I pray that you hide me behind the very cross of Jesus. Father, the words that are spoken from this moment forward, I pray, would be glorifying to you and your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Help me today, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you, I have a sermon today, I believe is going to take us on a journey, if you don't mind. And on that journey, um, I will get back to this point, okay? If you, you mind, if you just follow along with me, I'll get back to Genesis chapter 2. But it's going to take me a little while. If you don't mind, you just follow along with me on this journey. I want to share with you what happened back in February of 2012. The Lord gave me a vision of our journey here at Capital City Church. And that morning when I got up, it was a Sunday morning, I was excited because God, as you know, I'm... I, I think, was it young people will dream dreams or have visions, and the old people will have dreams, so I feel like I'm still in the young part, amen? And so I'm excited about that, um, and still having visions, so I believe God speaks to us through visions and dreams, amen? And uh, this particular day, God gave me a vision. I remember sharing it that morning with the congregation, and in the congregation, there's a couple people that help interpret the dream, amen? And we, get, we gave God glory, and I want to remind you again what God shared with me, and then talk about the interpretation of that. And then I'm going to take you on a little journey, and then we'll get back to Genesis chapter 2. Because I think God wants us to be together. Amen? Uh, the title of the sermon today is, We Can Do This. Amen? We, us, together, can do this. Not by myself or by yourself. We get to have, and we need each other. Amen? I remember, I, as I shared that uh, vision... Um, I was excited in my spirit. I didn't have all the interpretation, but I knew that God was giving me something powerful that would sustain the vision He gave for Capital City Church. Amen. And so, one of the things that He said, or the, I'm going to share the dream. Uh, the, it started like this. I was walking down this dirt path. I was holding some children, a uh, young girl, one young child by the hand, and I was leading a group of other young children, if you remember. And there were workers helping. Uh, every so many feet there was an adult worker helping and we're, dry, we're walking down this dirt path, it was dusty. We were heading to this field to work in the field to harvest the fruit that was there. And on the side of this trail was, or next to this trail was a railroad track and there was railroad cars there. Do you remember, some of you remember that, I shared that. And uh, as we came up to the railroad cars, a lady came out of the car with this beautiful uh, tray of vegetables, right? It was just a beautiful tray. It was uh, ornate. It was, uh, and it had all these vegetables on it. Do you remember that? And and I and I turned as I saw. I was already past the lady uh, where she came out to the trail where the kids were walking. And I turned around. I saw what was on the tray, and I said, and in my my in this vision, I said, no, they don't need vegetables. Remember what I said? They need meat. And then a gentleman came out of the, the vehicle, or the, the train, and he brought this other tray, just as ornate, and it had all these different meats on it, and it had cheese, I guess it was, because I'm from Wisconsin, I guess, I don't know why, <laughs> but there was cheese on there, protein, I guess, if you will, there was meat on this tray, and the children were able to eat of that. 
And then we went on our journey. And I woke up. I mean, the vision was over. And I thought, wow, that was really cool, God. I mean, I've had visions before, but nothing like that. You know, and what does that all mean? And I remember the little girl I was carrying, I was holding her hand, and she was rushing to get to the, she wanted to get to the field, to be the first one in the field to start to work. Amen? And I'll explain that just all in a little bit. But we looked at, we, we interpreted it, and through prayer, I believe God gave us this, that the children represented all the ministries that were going to be part of our church family. Amen? Different uh, ministries are being birthed through our church, amen? Some are, are a little bit more advanced than others, but there's going to be other ministries uh, going to be developed through our church. And I thought that was really cool. All those children represented ministries that were going to happen out of Capital City Church. I'm like, wow, God, you were really cool because I don't see that in the natural, but God sees it in the spiritual, amen? That's why God gives dreams and, and, and visions. So we see things not in our natural way, but we see them in the supernatural, Amen. And then the railroad track represented our journey. We're on a journey. We're on a track. We're going in the right direction. God is leading us. Amen. Isn't that great to know that we're heading in the right direction? You say, well, I look around me. I say, I don't see a lot of things happening right now. Listen, don't be discouraged. God knows that we're on the right track. Amen. And he's leading us. And then the field represents what? What does a field represent? Does anybody know? It represents the harvest field, right? There's, there's labor, we're laborers for the harvest. And this young girl was ready to go out there and, and bring in the harvest. Maybe she had a heart of evangelist, evangelism, amen. And she wanted to go out to the field and, and, and harvest, the, harvest the people that were there. And the Bible tells us that the field is already ripe. And that was when Jesus was there talking to his disciples. They how ripe it is now. I was... Uh, had an opportunity to minister or, or, or a counsel with someone this week, and, and she's from the university here, had been many, many years, and, and just it was just an amazing opportunity to share Jesus with her, very highly educated, but shared that God loved her and, and cared about her, and she just was just blown away by reading a couple of scriptures, and told her, I told her that uh, you're a daughter of God, and God does not want you to suffer, amen? And so the, those people out there are hungry for the truth and for comforting peace of God. And that's our mission. Is to, that's our main mission, to see a, a other people from all nations come to know Jesus. And then the helpers were the adult ministries, if you will, the, the, the leaders of the ministries. Like we see uh, uh, Pastor Ryan came and Jody now are, are taking care of the children. So, you know, I don't have to worry about that ministry down there. You know, we, we're, that's a ministry that's being taken care of. We have the worship team. We have the, the nursery being taken care of now. And there's other ministries that are going to be developed. We, we're looking at uh, developing uh, or launching cell groups probably in the fall. Amen. We want everybody to be part of that. And why do we want that? Because we can connect with more people in the church, and then hopefully uh, maybe somebody that you know that may not come to church on a Sunday morning, but they may come to your home in a small group uh, and come to know, to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Um, the meat was represented what? Does everybody know what that represents? The Word of God, amen? The, the meat is the Word of God. We can't just go off our experiences or what we did before. We have to study. We can't go by a business model, how to build a church. We have to go off the Word of God, how God designed this church to operate. We're going to teach everyone uh, that comes the basics of God's Word, that God loves them and that you're a son and daughter of God, that you can ask for forgiveness and all your sins can be forgiven. Your past can be healed and you can be a new person in Christ Jesus. Amen? There's a hope that we have in salvation. Amen? When we're absent from our body, the Bible says that we're present with the Lord. Amen? Your body goes to the grave and your spirit goes to be with God. Hallelujah. There's a hope that we have. And then God said he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Hallelujah. And all this, all, gonna be, all the corruption that we've seen over the years is going to go away and all of a sudden it's going to be new and we're going to worship Jesus the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Amen? It's going to be one more time. And I think the urgency of the little girl represents the urgency of the Holy Spirit that we need to be about the Father's business. Amen? Come on, let's go. She was ready. She wanted to get there. She wanted to get there. And uh, in the dream, I felt like she wanted to get there because she was going to work in the field so she could earn money or uh, income for her family. So we're going there for that reason. But, of course, we interpret that. That means the, the harvest field is ready. Amen? And the urgency is we need to be doing that now. Who can lead somebody to Jesus? 
Do you have to go through all the journey books and the D1, D2, and we have a Bible degree to lead somebody to Jesus? No, every anybody that said yes to Jesus can lead somebody else to Jesus. Amen? There's no you don't have to be qualified to do that. You might have to be qualified maybe to preach the word or teach the word or some, some training needs to get done. But to tell somebody that Jesus loves them, if any one of us can do that. Amen? Father, give us boldness today to be led by your spirit, to open our hearts and our mouths to share Christ, your love with other people. Amen? That's what I pray that we have it today. So anyway, as I was going through that, and I was, I was, uh, I was, um, 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 Examining that vision again this week, and, and God has poured it to me. You know, remind the people, remind the people what happened, but mind them what I said. I said, okay, and I'm going to talk about Adam and Eve, the sin of Adam and Eve for a minute. I think, you know, the sin that, that left them. You remember when Adam, in chapter 2, go back and read it, Adam was told not to eat from the tree of good and evil. And in chapter 3, then it says, then God took from man his side and created the woman. So who was given the instruction to not eat of that tree? Adam was. But who did the devil, if you will, the serpent, the snake, who did he go after? The woman. And what did he say? Did God say not to eat of that tree? Well, and, and, and Eve really wasn't there when God said that, so she didn't really know. She was just listening to her husband, right? And there, doubt came in. Did my husband really tell me the right thing? <laughs> you know, did he tell me? You know, did, you know. So, did, and so, uh, the, and the devil uh, uh, got in there, and she and she fell, and the, and they fell. They sinned. They ate of the tree, and they sinned. When they sinned, what happened to them? What happened when they sinned? Their eyes were open, yes. Their eyes were open. But what happened to them? It said, when they sinned, uh, God walked in the cool of the night and yelled out to Adam, right? Adam. Just like he does to us when we're not in the light, right? Adam. You put your name in there. Where are you? Where are you? Adam. And they hid themselves from God. Because now they recognize what sin was, right? They recognize they were, they were naked, right? But what happened to them? They, when God created Adam, the Bible says that he took the dust of the earth and he formed the man. And it says that he breathed into man the very breath of life, his spirit, God's spirit, entered into the man. You look at chapter 3 a little bit further. It says that he made man and women in his image. In our image, we made them. He made the man and the woman. And so they were fully God and fully human. They had a spirit. They had God's spirit in them. Amen? In the garden, Adam and Eve had God's spirit in them. But when sin came... Then the Spirit of God left them. They were escorted out of the garden. God had sacrificed an animal and made clothes for them and clothed them. And they left the garden never to return again. Until later on in the rest of the story, right? Sure. That is significant because man now walks on this earth without the Spirit of God in them. So you look at yourself, you say, how can people do the things they do? How can a man take a rifle, go into an elementary school, and shoot up a bunch of children and teachers? How does that happen? How do people just do such horrific things in this earth today? Because the Spirit of God is not in them. That's how God never intended us to have, be that way. And we're, on, we're working out of our own fleshly desires, and we do all this corruption that's in the world today. How can they have human trafficking? How can they have all the things that go on? People being abused, being taken advantage of. Child abuse, all the stuff that goes on. Abort. How can people kill unborn babies? Because they don't think, they have nothing, no reference of what is good because they work, they work out of their own flesh. The Spirit of God is no longer in them. You following me? 
until that moment when you bow your knees and you recognize by the Holy Spirit draws you to the presence of God and you realize you need a Savior, the Spirit of God is now deposited in you as a believer. And you begin to look at things different. You begin to look at the, the as nature different. You look at right and wrong differently. You look at morality differently. You look at things differently in your life because the Spirit of God is now in you. And then that wonderful day on the day of Pentecost, amen, when the Holy Spirit was given and uh, the people were baptized in the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God rested on man and filled them up and overflowed them, now we begin to think differently. And now we have compassion on the sinner and we, 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 we look at people with love and, and out of an eyes of God instead of eyes of man, amen? Because now the Spirit of God, we are now made complete, like, if you will, follow me for a second, like Adam and Eve were in the beginning. We don't hide from God now, right? We run towards Him. Even when we make a mistake, we want to go to the very presence of God. And we want Him to cleanse us and change us and change our character so we can be like God. Because the Spirit of God is in us now. That's the way God designed you and me. How many have ever heard that before? Huh? He's entering. His Spirit enter us. And it's like in the garden. God breathed into man. Now the Holy Spirit is now in us to change. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? Matthew chapter 3. Jesus was fully man. Right? And fully God. But he didn't start his ministry till when? Till the Holy Spirit came upon him. So Jesus going baptized by John. He goes out to the Jordan River. And he's baptized. And John baptizes him. And he goes down in the water. And he, as he comes up out of the water. He comes down. It goes down in his humanity. And he comes up fully God and fully man. As the Spirit of God comes on him. And he's able to do the work that he has to do. So I have a question for you. Here's another thing that will help you in your theology. When was Satan defeated? When was Jesus, did, when did Jesus defeat Satan? Think about this for a moment. The Bible says that Jesus is fully human and fully God. He, he knows he's been tempted in every way you were tempted. Amen? He, when he goes through everything that you go through. He knows everything you're, you're, you struggle with. He suffered all those things for us. He was tempted in every way. When he was, remember when Jesus got baptized, where did he go after he was baptized? Immediately he went to the desert, didn't he? He was tempted by Satan there. Look at all these kingdoms. Bow to me and I'll give you all of these things on the earth. Turn these rocks into bread, right? All those things, right? He's tempted in every way. Satan, he said to him, get behind me, Satan, right? Get behind me, Satan. You have no authority over me at all. And he walked from there and he out of the desert into Jerusalem and started his, his earthly ministry then. So when was Satan defeated? It was in the desert. When is Satan defeated in your life? Sometimes when you're going through the struggles, you're going through the trials, you're going through some tribulations, you can't have, you don't have an answer to your situation, and you're an enemy's on your case, telling you're no good, you're not worthy, you're not good enough. How many's been there? Amen. And you say, No, I'm a child of God. Jesus Christ died for my sins. I accept Him as my Lord and Savior. I'm now joint heirs with Him. I'm adopted into the family of God. I'm one of His. I'm one of His. He calls you son. And He calls you daughter. Hallelujah. Think about that. You're not just who you are in the natural, in the spiritual realm. You're God's children. 
And as you struggle through that situation, and as you come through the other side of it, you get victory over it, you realize that God helped you through it, amen? And you give Him all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, amen? He's defeated in your trials and tribulations. He's, a, he's defeated in, a, in your tough times. How many Christians have gone through some tough times? All of us have. We all go through that. We go through doubt and fear. We go through struggles. Only believe. God, help my unbelief. How many ever prayed that? I want to believe God, but man, it's tough right now. The bills are piling up. My paycheck is here. My pastor told me I have to tithe now. That takes, I mean, I live on 90% of my income, but the bills come up to 120%. I don't know how it's going to work, but I'm going to trust God. And all of a sudden, you see God start promoting you, giving you pay raises. And as you trust them in that little thing, you know, maybe I make, make it $200 a week, so I try 20. Then I start making 2000 a week, then it's 200 And as you go up and up, God just gives you the ability to give and give and give. And God will bless you in that giving. Amen. You can't figure it out. It's just not, it's not in the natural you can't figure it out. But in the spiritual, God multiplies that in a mighty way. You have to trust Him through it. Amen. Every time that we go through a struggle, Every time we go through doubt and fear, our life just seems like it's turned upside down. God will always make a way to escape. Amen? It's through Jesus Christ and Him alone. Amen? Hallelujah. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good because I know it's good stuff. Amen? Listen, we go through stuff, but through the power of the Spirit, because now you're a child of God. You're not like you were, like Adam and Eve were in the garden. You don't have to hang your head low. You don't have to clothe yourself with stuff that doesn't is not important, amen? You don't have to pretend you're somebody else. God knows you. He knows everything about you. All you have to do is say yes to Him, amen? And you, and He'll help you through that. We can stand with our head raised high. I'm a child of God. Speak to, you know what, sometimes we have problems with this, our tongue. When we're going through trials, we think, oh, I'm not good enough. God don't love me. People don't care about me. Sometimes in our ministry at Capital City Church, like, oh, it's rough in Madison. It's tough here. Look at there's nobody here on Sunday. What, what, what's happening? This, what's this ministry might not, it's not good enough. Listen, take all those bad thoughts and those words, you turn around and say, God, I thank you for what I'm going through right now. Help change me or whatever's in my character to be so I'm a better person on the other side of this because we're going to go through it. Amen? Psalms 23, 23 says, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We don't stop and have a picnic when we're going through problems, amen? I mean, every, your, your psychologist, your sociologist, all those people want to give you medicine, want to get, get, have a pity party, you know, oh, poor you, poor you. But listen, you don't have to believe that. Listen, I might have a problem, but as a believer, God's going to help me through this. I might not be able to do it on my own strength, but with the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to get through this. Amen. I'm going to have victory on the other side. God wants you to have victory. From victory to victory, from glory to glory. God, we go through life like that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Each and every one of us do that. But there's power in your tongue. James tells us that. We have death comes out of our mouth, or we have life come out of our mouth. You choose. When you go through a situation, are you going to get no molly grubs? Oh, oh me, oh my. And sometimes we get there, right? Or are you going to believe what the Word of God says? That we are overcomers. Matter of fact, we're more than overcomers. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Amen? That means we're going to go through the situation and we're going to be victorious in it. Amen? And so we can say, have a positive attitude. If the most happiest, positive people on the earth should be Christians. Amen? <coughs> Come on. <coughs> Across the world. We might not see it in Madison right now, but we're going to see it. But across the world, there's revival. Thousands and thousands. Asia and Africa and South America, even Russia. Hallelujah. Japan, there's revival. People coming to Jesus by the hundreds, daily. Just amazing things that are happening across the world. I'm praying, God, let it happen in America again. Let your revival fire come. Let that fire start in me. Let me have compassion for the lost. Let me not be, be quiet, but let me be bold. Uh, fill me again with your spirit of God. That I can be a witness here in Madison, in my neighborhood, in my workplace, in Wisconsin, wherever the Lord, wherever my feet, I, wherever my feet take me, Lord, let me be your witness in this world. Amen? 
God will do that. Let it happen again. But we can kill that by the things that we say. We're never going to get out of the situation. No, that's not true. Amen? This is too much for me. Some words I've said recently. I can't deal with it anymore. You're right, Bob. You can't deal with it. But with God, you can do anything. Hallelujah. Come on, smile at me. This is good stuff. This is good. We can speak life into our situation or we can speak death into our situation. You choose. Amen? Now this is a uh, this is a short sermon today. That's good though, right? It said this, the last point, it says, so we are going to believe, are we going to believe the vision and the direction that God's taking? See, we can't, or I can't do it myself. Amen? God said to the woman, you have to leave your mother and father right, and cleave to your husband or be with your husband. He said about, he said, he said two of you together could do anything. Replenish the whole thing. Like, leave your mother and father, which she didn't have one at that point. Prophetic word for us today. Cleave to your husband, be close to your husband. Replenish the earth or replenish the earth. Amen. Two people replenish the whole earth. Got a great task ahead of you. Amen. They could do it by themselves. The man could do it by himself. The woman could do it by himself. Just like God. Remember when God, uh, Jesus told his disciples, the, the seventy, to go out two by two. Don't take any money. Don't take your clothes. Don't take anything but go. And the Holy Spirit will provide for you. Those that welcome you, you go into their home and stay with them. Those that don't welcome you, dust the, the, your, uh, the dust off your uh, dust off your sandals and just continue to minister, right? But he, well, he didn't send them by themselves, did he? He sent them together. Amen. Two by two. They went out. Amen? You can't do it by yourself. The Holy Spirit will do it with you. He also, think about the disciples. He picked 12 of them, right? And at Think about, I was thinking about uh, Peter. The day he denied Jesus. Do you remember the story? Jesus, he said, oh, God, I'll die for Jesus, I'll die for you. He brought a sword, right? He cut off the high priest's ear. And Jesus told him right before that, he said, you're going to deny me three times before the crow, the rooster crows in the morning. And what happened? Peter did it. He denied him. Three times. The difference between Peter and Judas was this. Peter's heart was broken. Read it. Peter's heart was broken. And Jesus saw something in Peter. Like he sees in you and me. There's a greater work to be done. And then you see that as he, as he resurrected, he told them, he said, Go in Jerusalem and tarry there until I undo you with power. What power was he going to give him? He was going to give him the power, the promise the Father gave from the beginning of the Holy Spirit. And as they were in that upper room, 120 of them, and they, the Bible says they were one accord, they were one spirit, they were together, they were in unity. They were there for one purpose. And I don't know what song they're singing. Maybe we're singing that song, Dove Eyes. I don't know. They're focusing on the Father and being obedient to the, what Jesus told them to do. And they begin to worship. And the Bible says all of a sudden there was a mighty wind that came through there as tongues of fire. Like I said last week, I don't know what that would really look like. But it must have been pretty cool. God did it. Amen. And it came on them. And they were filled with the Spirit of God. And they began to speak in a tongue, a language that they didn't even know. Power came on them. And as they went down from the upper room into the court, people thought they were drunk. They told them we were just the third day. And I think with Peter's 
you look at Peter's life, all the mistakes that he made. And <laughs> like, funny, you know, I was like, Jesus, is that you on the water? And like, everybody's going, yeah, that's, that's Jesus out there on the water. They're like, okay, Peter, you go check it out. <laughs> Amen? John pushing Peter out of the boat. Okay, you go and see, go out there. And he walks on the water, amen, and Jesus brings him back to the boat. They get back in the boat together, and instantly they're on the other side. A whole other story. But that's just an amazing story. Maybe I'll share some of that next week. How the demonic forces were holding the disciples from being back to the other side. Because remember on the other side was the, the, the man that was uh, full of a legion of demons, right? But instantly, they were, Jesus was in the boat, and it says immediately they were on the other side already. The storm was gone, they were there. The power of the supernatural, the power of God in your life, can cast uh, demons. So the day of Pentecost, they went down, they were in the, in the courtyard of the temple, and they were praising God, they were worshiping in their, their this new language, and all the other people heard them in their language, if you read that in Acts 2. And you see that all these people were listening and hearing. And all of a sudden they're like, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of this? I could hear the crowd. What is this about? What is this about? And then their disciples were standing there. And I think what they did in unity, listen, in unity, in anointing that the Holy Spirit gave Peter at that moment, in anointing that was on the disciples at that very moment, they got together and said, Peter, they didn't say, oh, you made all these mistakes back here. They said, Peter, why don't you speak for us? Amen? And as Peter stood up at that moment, when the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit was on him, and I think there was a corporate anointing that was with those 12 and the 120 that were there. They were in agreement with Peter. And Peter began to speak and said, what you see here was promised by the Father. These men are not drunk. And you begin to share about Joel, the promise of the Father. And you begin to share about this Jesus that they just crucified just a few days earlier. A few, a couple weeks earlier. This Jesus was the very Son of God. And it said in the Word of God there, it says that on that very moment, over three thousand of them believed. Jewish people that were just weeks earlier saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now we're saying, yes, that he was now their savior of their lives and their lives changed immediately. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It was a corporate anointing. It was anointing of God on him. As they went together to do out in that court. They didn't just send Peter. They didn't stay in his upper room and say, okay, Peter, go down there and talk to him. They were there together, working together, and the anointing of the group, and it, it produced a magnificent results for the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? God had never intended you to be alone. God never intended any ministry to do anything by itself. We have to do it together. Amen? I need you I need you to fulfill the vision that God has given me for this church. Amen? I need you to step up and do what God's telling you to do. We have a harvest field that's right. Amen? We, it's, uh, it's amazing. I'm telling you, in um, just, in just a few months, just in a couple months down the road, we're looking at September, we're looking at launching our cell groups. We're going to, we're going to do, start a new advertising campaign for Capital City Church. We're saying, this is all we want you to do at our church. We want you to do two things. We want you to be involved in our Sunday morning worship service. And we want you to be involved in a cell group. Amen? And that's it. Because in those two things, we'll reach the city for the kingdom of God. Amen? In those two, two things, we'll see those people that are hurting like this woman I talked to this week was just devastated by her situation. And the only thing that could change her life was Jesus, was the Word of God. As I opened up the Word of God and shared it with her, she began to see that God loved her as a daughter and God wants to have peace and love and joy and patience in her life. Let's, in fact, let's just turn, I want to share with you what I shared with her. Turn you in your Bibles, if you will, or your iPad or your cell phone or whatever you use. 
But please turn in with me to Galatians. Chapter 5. Or chapter, yeah, chapter 5. And this is what I shared with her. And it brought such peace. I'm telling you, you might not know what to say, but just use the word of God. I don't know what to tell the person. But you can tell them this. It says it in uh, Matthew, uh, Galatians 5, and verse 16 says, So I say, live by the Spirit. So I say, live by the Spirit. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they couldn't live by the Spirit because the Spirit of God left them. Amen? But now we have, if you're a believer today, you have the Spirit of God deposited in you. And if you believe in the baptism of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you and is in, uh, if you're immersed in the Spirit of God and we, have, we can now walk in the fullness of our humanity. Amen? We don't have to think like we thought before we were saved. We don't have to act like we act before we were saved. We are now in the fullness of what God intended us to be. Can you say amen? Amen. Or, or I like to say, oh me. Like sometimes we don't get there. But it says, so I say, Live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Because the sinful nature was buried when you became, or was, uh, defeated when you said yes to Jesus. Now let's be honest. How many struggle with our sinful nature sometimes? All right. Today we're going to talk about that at the end of service. You don't have to struggle with that anymore. How many want to be free from that? Because with every temptation, Jesus, God, through His Word, made a way to escape. You don't have to satisfy your sinful nature. Amen? And now look at, I don't go through all the different things. It says, for the sinful nature desires what is contrary, contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. So when you're struggling in your sinful nature, human nature, you're not desire, you're not, it's contrary to your spirit person. Amen. You ever get that battle within you? I want to do good, but I can't do good. But then when I, I try to do good, it's, it's, I struggle, like Paul said. Because you're, you're fulfilling your sinful nature, not your spirit nature. And we talked about, we talked about it a little bit like a couple weeks ago. We fill, we, we uh, fill, we feed the spirit nature and we grow and we we feel our, our natural nature that we die. If you think about it, Adam and Eve, when they were tempted, they were fulfilling what? Their sinful, their human nature, not their spirit nature, amen? They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You're not under the curse of the law. Amen? When you walk after the Spirit. What does God require of us? Do you ever think about that? What does God require of us? Everything. Everything, when we give everything over to Him, He said He provide all that we need. You ever think about that way? If I surrender all my life to Him and everything I am, then He'll provide what I need. That's pretty amazing. But He wants all of us. It's really difficult. I know. We have a great task ahead of us to fulfill the calling that God put on our life. Now, what He said this. I'll look at verse 22. I think Tina shared this too a couple weeks ago. But let me remind you, as I shared this with this late this week, this is what I shared with you. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. Now listen, when I try to struggle in my sinful nature, I can't find these things in my life. I'm not peaceful. I'm not loving. I get grumpy. 
I get angry. I do things that I say things. I do things I don't want to do. I struggle with that. I try not. I try to do good, but then I do bad. Come on, I myself talking to anybody out here. To, am I, you know what I'm saying? We do this, but when we walk in the Spirit, when we desire the Spirit, we say, God, give us dumb eyes so we can focus on You and not on the things of this world. All of a sudden, we see these things happening in our lives. The things that we, we want to do, the things we work 40, 50 hours, 60 hours a week for, the things that we desire, says, uh, the Spirit of God says, love and joy comes only from the Spirit. Joy does not come from your accomplishments on this world. Joy only comes from walking in the Spirit. You can have all the cars, all the things you want, everything. It doesn't happen. Joy is not there. Joy only comes when you walk in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Don't shut me down when I was preaching good. It says, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Lord, help me to be more gentle and self-control. Against such things there are no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have cruci... Listen to this. Verse 24 highlighted in your Bible. Highlighted in your iPhone. On your pad, iPad. It says... Uh, those who belong to Christ Jesus are crucified. The sinful nature... And its passions and desires. Our sinful nature has passions and desires that are opposite of those things of God. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. But God, look at the verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, I'm talking positively. I'm speaking blessings into your life right now. Since we walk in the Spirit of God, amen, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Don't get ahead of the Spirit. Don't get behind. But let's walk in step with the Spirit. He's there every day with you. He, he's there to convict you. He's there, he's there to encourage you. Amen. So let us keep in step with spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envy one another. You ever meet those Christians that you think they're better than everybody else? This verse right here tells you don't be like that. Let's just walk together. We can do this together. Amen. Walking hand in hand, walking two by two, walking in ministry, complimenting one another, blessing one another, encouraging one another. Why did God give us the gift of tongues and interpretation? So we can prophesy. Why did we prophesy? So we can encourage each other and strengthen each other in the Lord. Amen? Because we need that. Because the world is fighting against us. The enemy doesn't like where you're at with God. And he's going to do everything he can to cause you to falter and go back to that sinful nature. But you say, no, I'm not going to walk after my sinful nature. You can correct yourself. I do this often. You don't have to walk after your sinful person. You can walk after the Spirit. Bob, get in line with the Word of God. Start speaking joy, love, patience. Amen? Encouragement. Those are things that we need to do. Listen, it's the hardest thing to do to compliment one another, isn't it? Because in the corporate world, we're not going to compliment somebody by doing a good job because we want to look better than they do. Come on. Huh? We want to look better than the next guy so we can get the promotion, or we can get the better office, or we can get the whatever, you know? But in the spirit, we're saying, God, I want to encourage my friend, my brother, my co-workers. Think about this. Bless your co-workers by telling them how great a job they're doing and see how they react to you. What's wrong with you? They, they don't get it. Because it's not the nature, natural thing to do. It's only by the spirit you can compliment and encourage I mean, they go they to coaching classes as managers to teach them how to encourage people and, and help your employees feel better. And if you're a Christian, you're already doing it. Amen? You already got management skills that come from heaven. Treat others like you would want yourself to be treated. Or is that in the Word of God? Amen? Exalt your brother. It says, exalt the ministry. You look at, don't look at the church. You say, wow, look at all the stuff that's going on upstairs at Pastor Ryan's church. Man, he's got everybody working down there. You can complain, complain, complain. Or you can say, God, bless the children's ministry. Let those kids love Jesus. Give Pastor Ryan more resources than he has right now. Amen. Let pray. For, matter of fact, you guys can pray for the camp. Has anybody been praying for the camp yet? We have, from the public, we have zero people registered right now. For camp. We spent a lot, and Pastor Ryan has spent a lot of resources. Pray for camp. Bless him. Every time you think about Pastor Ryan and Jody and the workers that are going to be working for the summer camp, bless them. 
God, give them more resources. We don't. We got twenty five hundred dollar check in there. Everybody, there. that's really cool. No, I would. I would like everybody here to write twenty five hundred dollar check. We'll have everything covered then for the rest of the summer. Just God, just bless. Just God bless you, Amen. Don't, don't stop giving. Don't stop praying. We want to resource them. They they're just don't have any more room for stuff, Amen. We want God to bless that. That we want to be a great light in this city, and that's just one of the ways we're going to do that. The other way we're going to do is that we, as we continue to realize that we're here. Not for just ourselves, but for the ministry of seeing others come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Amen? What we can't do it by our own See, but now, as you and me being believers, let me just put this, land this plane, all right? You and me being believers. And as a believer, the Spirit of God, I remember that day, I told you last week, I remember that day I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. The Spirit, something happened. He deposited the Spirit in me. And man, I knew I was no good, but I knew I was, God did something, He changed me. I was smiling. I wasn't in jail, like I told you, but I was smiling. There was some peace in me and happiness. I can't explain it, but it was really cool. I've never experienced that all my, in all my life. I've been to church. I've been, I mean, my grandma took me to church and stuff. I never, but I never had what God deposited me in that moment. It was amazing. I looked out the window, the sky, I never seen a blue sky before that day. The grass was so green, it was unbelievable. I was just like, that's all. I heard a bird singing. Man, I was like, that was the most beautiful sound in the whole world. I just, I didn't, I, my, my, my whole perspective of the world just changed because now I was looking at things in my spirit, not just at my natural flesh. I was whole. I was whole. How God intended me to be back in the garden. Amen. We can do this together. Let's, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. I remember a couple of years ago, Tina and I and Richard were in the office on Wednesday night. We were the only ones here at church that, that night. That was before most of you were here at this church. And we were praying and seeking the Lord and God gave us this verse. And I think it's pertinent to what God's doing for us in the future. Not get off track. Remember again, visions and dreams and the Word of God helps us stay on track with God. Amen. And so through this process of preparing today, the Lord reminded me. Actually, I finished typing this out last night before I went to sleep. So it's like I just couldn't stop typing. It was like, and I'm not a good speller. And I got my new uh, computer, and I'm still learning how to spell checker. But anyway, it's like you know, I spell this. I just make sure it's spelled right. Away. No, but anyway, it was just one of those moments. But God was just downloading. Everything to me, and then he reminded me at the end of my my, my sermon, uh, this verse, Amen, Acts two forty two, and let me read it to you. It says, "They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship of the breaking of bread, and through prayer. And everyone was filled with awe, and many signs, wonders, and miracles and signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together." And everyone had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to everyone in need. Every day they continued to be together in the temple court. They broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord God added to their number daily those who be saved. That's what we're going to do. That's going to be our model for our solid right there. We're going to meet together. We're going to meet together in homes or maybe churches or coffee shops or wherever the cell groups meets. And we're going to break bread together. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to encourage each other. And we're going to see God do a mighty thing. We can do this. Amen? We can do this. If you believe God can do this, would you stand in your seat where you're at? If you believe God can do that together, we can do this together for God. Would you stand? Tina, would you come and play that song again? Hallelujah. Would you put that uh, 